Uh, a lot of you have been sitting here for a very long time, and we're about to talk about energy. So I want you all to get up, just get up, all right? And shake your legs a little bit, all right? Shake your arms a little bit. Okay, good. Say hello to your neighbor. All right. All right. All right, good, good. Hopefully that provided a little bit of energy. Um, so I'm going to talk now about energy and progress. Uh, you heard a lot of conversation about energy and things like, you know, people worrying about the electricity bill. Uh, I'm going to try and zoom out massively from the worry about this month's electricity price to the question of how are energy and human progress related. So um, this is a very, very important chart. Um, on this chart, you have lots of countries, and on the horizontal axis, you have GDP per capita, which is some approximate measure of wealth. Um, and on the vertical axis, you have um, per capita energy consumption. Um, and these are logarithmic axes, which means as you go across, you kind of double, and on the vertical axis, you multiply by 10. Now, uh, Germany's here, near Denmark, a little less wealthy. There's one, well, first of all, it's amazing that you can fit this many countries and get this good a fit. I mean, these are very tightly correlated around this axis, so that's quite unusual to begin with. But there's one extremely important feature of this chart, and that is there is an empty area here. You cannot be a wealthy, low-energy country. It does not exist anywhere in the world, okay? So this is very, very important. You cannot be a wealthy, low-energy country. All right. So, how come? Why is that so? So, I want to kind of draw a very large arc about how energy has contributed to human progress. And I want to go really, really far back to the first really important human invention of energy, the first really big energy breakthrough. And that is fire. Um, it's a picture I took myself, no. Um, so, fire was a huge energy breakthrough. Um, it completely changes how much uh, meat you can consume. It changes how many calories you get out of the meat. Um, and what did this make possible? It made possible big brains. Humans, relative to the size of our body, have a huge brain. And it let us pull away from lots of other species um, that didn't figure out fire. To this date, we are the only species on this planet that can reliably make fire. No, no other species can do this. This let us pull away. This was a huge, it set us going on the path of progress that we're on to, a huge, huge breakthrough. What was the second big breakthrough? Well, the second big breakthrough was agriculture. It's an energy breakthrough. Instead of having to go hunt animals and find them out in the woods, you start having them on the pasture, and you breed them. And so you have many of them, and they're easy to access. And instead of having to go pick berries, you take a whole bunch of um, various plants, and you grow them right next to each other, and you irrigate them, and you fertilize them. Huge energy breakthrough, like 10x energy density of um, production. And what did this enable? It enabled big societies. This is a uh, 1490s um, drawing of my hometown of Nuremberg, Germany. Um, that is a huge society compared to any of the hunter-gatherer societies. These are thousands of people, and there were tens of thousands of people in these societies in the agrarian age. So second huge breakthrough, incredible progress that happened because of an energy unlock. What was the third big energy breakthrough? Well, fossil fuels early drilling rigs in Baku. Um, what did fossil fuels enable? Fossil fuels powered the industrial economy. Um, this is a Volkswagen plant that literally has the power plant built into the industrial production plant. This is how crucial fossil fuels were to the industrial age. So I've given you three big breakthroughs in human history that came where progress was made because we made a breakthrough in energy. There's a more fundamental question. Why is energy and progress so deeply related? Well, it has to do with creating order. This is a picture where you've got coal on one side, you've got um, iron ore on the other, and then you've got a metal product in the middle. These are very unstructured. This is a highly structured product. Like, all of progress is about creating order out of more chaotic stuff. And by the way, maintaining order also requires energy. It's not just creating order. This is what happens to your room when you don't pick up after yourself, right? This is what happens to your car when you don't maintain it. 
the natural state of the world is not order, it's disorder. And stuff tends towards disorder. I mean, our house certainly tends towards disorder. Um, and then when you supply energy back into the system, you can um, clean it up, you can restore order. But this is fundamentally why energy and progress are related. You need energy to create order. Okay, so how are we doing? Um, it turns out we've got problems. You've already heard about some of these problems today. Um, uh, couldn't resist putting Houston, we have a problem because of, of course Houston is you know, one of the oil capitals of the world. Um, and so that is our first problem, right? The first problem is that so much of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. And that's a problem because when we burn them, we put carbon in the atmosphere, that's greenhouse gases, that's what's causing global warming and the climate crisis at a massive scale. But there's a second problem in this chart that's maybe less obvious. And that's, we've had l roughly linear growth in energy. You might be like, well, why is that a problem? I mean, humanity has actually been growing somewhat linearly. We've been sort of adding a billion people um, every once in a while. Um, so shouldn't this be okay? No, it's very much not okay. Because as we saw earlier, if we want big progress, we need an energy breakthrough. Linear growth is not an energy breakthrough. Okay. Let's zoom in though on this chart. That looks like exponential growth. So you can see the slope getting steeper and steeper and steeper. And then we hit 1973. What happened? The 70s. <laughs> All right, they were spiffy dresses and it definitely wasn't these people's fault. Um, that's actually a TV show about the 70s. Um, no, but what really happened? Well, this is one thing that happened. The Club of Rome published The Limits to Growth. It was a book that basically said, we're gonna run out of this stuff. These fossil fuels, they're gonna go away. We cannot afford the level of growth that we have. We need to dial things back. Second thing that happened, a year later, the first oil crisis. OPEC got together, restricted supply, the price of oil shut up, and people were like, oh my God, we can't afford this. This is terrible. What did people decide to do? They decided that the salvation was gonna be energy conservation. In fact, in the US, we passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, which in the description of the act, does say to increase domestic energy supply, but it specifically says to restrain energy demand. That meant more efficient light bulbs, more efficient dishwashers, etc. And this worked. It worked in the sense that you can see this chart where US per capita energy consumption goes up and up and up and up, and then we hit 1975 and it just starts to go horizontal. So in that sense, it worked. But we did this around the globe. And what was the result of it? We went from exponential growth, roughly to the 1970s, to linear growth in energy. And that's bad, really bad, like extremely bad. In fact, I think of it as a trap. It's the low energy trap. All right, I'm, I'm a nerd, okay. Some people will get this reference in the audience. Many won't, all right. But it's a trap, it's a real trap, okay. So why is it a trap? Because we need more energy, like way, way, way more energy than we have today. What do we need this energy for? Data centers. Data centers are incredible degrees of order. I mean, you can see how orderly the cabling is, but what I really mean is like each CPU is like this extraordinary marvel of order. A state of bits that actually represents something is a state of order. These are the most highly ordered systems that we've built as humanity. They take insane amounts of energy. We want to electrify everything because we want to fight the fossil fuels. We want to electrify cars and home heating and industrial processes. We need way more energy for that. We want to clean up the mess that we've made. We want to pull the carbon back out of the atmosphere. We want to have e-fuels instead of regular fuels. Way more energy. We want to do awesome things like go into space. Like lob objects, heavy objects into space. I really am a huge fan of this, this does a lot of good things. Uh, I sailed across the Atlantic last year, I had Starlink the entire way, it was fantastic. Um, so these are all things we want to do and they all require energy. Okay, so there's one more thing though. It's democracy that also requires energy. This is an absolutely incredible book. It was published in 1988 and I urge everybody to read it. 
It's a short book, it's a 200 page book. Tainter is an anthropologist and he studied lots of different civilizations. And his key conclusion is that complex societies fail all for the same reason. And the reason is that they built up complexity, bureaucracy. You heard a lot earlier about bureaucracy. They build up bureaucracy. Bureaucracy has a lot of advantages at first, but then it gets more and more expensive to maintain. And eventually, you get to this thing where the complexity that you've built up, you have fewer and fewer advantages and more and more disadvantages, and you collapse. And he made the observation towards the end of the book, he writes, industrial societies are subject to the same principles. Like, we may think that we're smarter than the Romans, but these principles apply to us just as well as they apply to these earlier societies. And then the other thing that he writes is, in ancient societies, the solution to declining marginal returns, this is declining marginal returns to complexity, was to capture a new energy subsidy. This is very euphemistic. This is slaves. You go and get yourself some slaves, or you occupy some territory, you extract some resources from somewhere else. That's what he meant by capture a new energy subsidy. But then he goes on to write, the capital and technology available must be directed towards some new and more abundant source of energy. This was written in 1988, when we were in the midst of this conservation push, when everybody thought we could get our way to the future by conserving energy, instead by making tons more of it. Okay, I recommend reading the book. There is, however, amazing news. We have, in fact, an energy source that's growing exponentially. Globally, solar deployment is growing exponentially. It's still small relative to everything else, but when you have exponential growth, you get very far, very quickly. This is really fantastic news. By the way, there was a panel earlier where somebody from Commonwealth Fusion Systems was here. They're trying to build fusion here on Earth. We have fusion today. It's called remote fusion. The sun provides the fusion and it sends the photons down here. It sends ordered energy our way, which we get to collect very cheaply. There's only one problem, the infamous Dunkelflaute. All right, so um, this is a chart of energy production in Germany not that long ago, um, week, calendar week 50 of last year. And if you look at the middle of this chart, wow, the colors look really washed out on the magnification, but what you can see are these three days in a row here. And what you see on these three days is virtually no yellow, which means basically no solar. And if you look outside today, it's pretty overcast, not a lot of solar. And then the light green is entirely missing in these days. What is the light green? That's wind energy. So dunkel, flaute, means it's dark, you don't get a lot of solar, and flaute means there's no wind, so you get no wind energy. Now, <clears throat> the top line is German energy consumption. As you can see, there is a very large gap between production and consumption. That electricity is purchased from neighboring countries, spiking the price in those countries and making them very unhappy. Well, the amounts of energy here are mind-boggling. This is in megawatts, so this is 50 gigawatts here. So you can see like a 20 gigawatt that's missing here. Um, you form the integral over this, meaning you add them up. These are you know, gigawatt hours, but not like one gigawatt hour. This is like 40 gigawatt hours, 70 gigawatt hours of storage that's missing. Okay, this is a real problem. And honestly, Germany's in trouble. Remember this chart? There is no wealthy, low-energy country. Well, this German trajectory of electricity production. Germany produces less electricity in 2024 than it produced in 1990. Yeah, it's that bad. Okay, I'm going to speed up because I'm at the end of my time. So, um, what should be done? Um, as we like to say in the US, build, baby, build. There's only one way to get out of this. You have to build a lot more stuff. You have to build a lot more storage, energy storage. You have to build new types of energy. You have to reactivate nuclear. Um, you have to admit that you're gonna use fossil fuels for much longer than you thought, so you're gonna have to build carbon capture. You just have to build, build, build. But here's the thing. Because we have this exponential growth of solar energy, if we do it right and we complement it with these other technologies and breakthroughs, we can live in this awesome high energy future. This is the future we should all want to live in. And that just requires a metric ton more energy across the board. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.